Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Now while I cover a variety of topics on this channel, there is a strong focus on William Shakespeare. I talk about individual plays in their historical moment, I do deep dives on elements of the text, I've also got videos that lay out the theatrical and cultural landscape in which William Shakespeare and his contemporaries were working. I'll be sure to link the most relevant video in a card up here. In that video, I make reference to the liberties. These were areas that existed outside of the city limits of London and therefore were not under the control of the Common Council. In these liberties, things like professional playing, could flourish. The city fathers were not particularly keen on professional players or their work, so they had to move outside in order to succeed. In addition, you may also find bear baiting, bullfighting and cockfighting. Similarly, if you were in medieval or early modern Southwark, for example, and walking around the streets, you may find yourself face to face with groups of people known as Winchester's geese. And today's video is all about them. to admit that my grasp of geography is not as good as it perhaps should be but one thing I'm sure of is that Southwark and Winchester are quite different places. So why are Winchester's geese called that and what is their connection to Southwark? To explain this and to understand it fully we need to go back to the mid 12th century. At this time the Bishop of Winchester is the brother of King Stephen of England. His name is Henry of Blois and what Bishop Henry determines that he needs is a London residence and so in 1149 he purchases Bermondsey Abbey in Southwark to be that residence. In doing so Bermondsey Abbey and its surrounding area of Southwark become under the control of the Bishop of Winchester. They become his liberty in which he can write and enforce law as he sees fit. When King Stephen died in 1154, he was succeeded by his second cousin, Henry II. Henry II was the son of Stephen's cousin, great enemy and rival for the throne, Empress Matilda. In 1161-2, the Parliament of Henry II supported the Bishop of Winchester, still Henry of Blois, to licence the bathhouses or stews as brothels through issuing a parliamentary ordinance regarding the government of stew holders in Southwark under the direction of the Lord Bishop of Winchester. Subsequent bishops would realise that this liberty status is a way to earn money. And they do so by fining, but also licensing the stews or bathhouses of Southwark as sites of sex work. There were periods when our monarchs and national leaders attempted to close down Southwark's brothels. Henry VII did so in 1503, his son, Henry VIII, attempted it in 1519 and also in 1546-7. to Similarly, while we lived under the Parliamentarian Commonwealth, which lasted from the execution of Charles I in 1649 to the restoration of his son, Charles II, in 1660, the liberties were reclaimed from the bishops. Theatres, bear pits and brothels thus closed during this period. But it wasn't until 1888 that the local government actually abolished all liberties and removed the feudal rights that they offered their owners. The bishops were essentially profiting off of the labours and risks taken by the women involved. Now, this wasn't a secret. The women get their name Winchester's Geese because the public was fully aware that the bishop, these holy men, were engaged in this licensing and profiteering off of this sex work. And you may think that the knock-on effect would be quite fortuitous. Being licensed by the bishop, surely these women would get a degree of protection or even respectability. Unfortunately not. While their labours lined the pockets of the bishop, their status in society remained pretty much unchanged. For me, there is a startling level of hypocrisy that the bishops of Winchester are willing to line their purses and coffers with this seemingly, as they would say, immoral labour. And yet they will do nothing to support these women, to make their conditions better or to add to their social respectability. 
they are quite happy for them to be denounced as prostitutes and whores. But they themselves get rich off of their labours and the risks they take. Equally, the fact that the community doesn't call out the bishops for this is perhaps surprising. Yet, if I'm going to put on my devil's advocate hat, pun firmly intended, maybe this is understandable. These are holy men of the church. They can't be seen to be condoning this sort of behaviour. Profit from it, yes, condone it, absolutely not. But in the Catholic world, according to Rome, if you pay money to the church, then perhaps you're able to buy your way out of purgatory a little bit earlier. Surely these bishops, in profiting from these women, will do something for their immortal souls, things that they can't do for their earthly bodies. They will see to it that these women have a proper Christian burial, that masses are sung for their souls to get them out of purgatory quicker. That must be what this money will ensure, right? Mm, not so much. As it turns out, the final resting place for a number of these women, we believe, was found in the 1990s. The Museum of London undertook an archaeological dig on a site intended for the Jubilee Line. Because London is basically made of history, when new buildings go up or new tunnels get dug, it's a great time to bring in the archaeologists to check we aren't disturbing anything or ruining anything that is of national historical significance. And it seems that's what they found. In a survey of London from 1598, John Stowe explains that in Southwark was, quote, sometimes the bordello or stews, a place so called of certain stew houses privileged there for the repair of incontinent men to the like women. I have heard of ancient men of good credit report that these single women were forbidden the rights of the church so long as they continued that sinful life and were excluded from Christian burial if they were not reconciled before their death. And therefore, there was a plot of ground called the single woman's churchyard, appointed for them, far from the parish church. Matthew Concannon and Aaron Morgan's History and Antiquities of the Parish of St Saviour's Southwark seems to refer to John Stowe's account when they highlight the fact that this burial ground was unconsecrated. They say the following. Our readers will remember that, in the account we have given of the stews on Bankside, mention is made of a piece of ground called the Single Woman's Burying Ground, set apart as the burial place of these unfortunate females. We are very much inclined to believe this was the spot, for in early times the ceremony of consecration would certainly not have been omitted, and if it had been performed, it would doubtless have appeared by some register either in the possession of the Bishop of Winchester or in the proper ecclesiastical court. We find no other place answering the description given of a ground appropriated as a burial place for these women. Circumstances therefore justify the supposition of this being the place, for it was said the ground was not consecrated, and the ordination was that they should not be buried in any spot so sanctified. Subsequently, in 1833, William Taylor wrote that, quote, there is an unconsecrated burial ground known as the Cross Bones at the corner of Red Cross Street, formerly called the Single Woman's Burial Ground, which is said to have been used for this purpose. This purpose being the disposal of the earthly remains of women such as the Winchester's geese, unbaptized children and paupers. Those forgotten, arguably, by the society in which they inhabited discarded and denied a proper consecrated burial in hallowed ground. This is what the site looks like now. Crossbones Cemetery, an unconsecrated pauper burial ground. This was a place where sex workers, outcasts, those too impoverished to afford it and unbaptized babies would have found their final rest. It is believed that throughout its period of operation, some 15,000 individuals were buried here. By 1853, the graveyard had become so overcrowded that it led to, to public concern and complaints, and eventually Crossbones was closed for good. Since its rediscovery, members of the local community have engaged in tireless efforts to keep it preserved as a site of memorial. At Crossbones Red Gate, we can see that there are hung mementos and ribbons, bearing the names and dates of death of some of what they term the outcast dead. 
people who are believed to have been buried in this formerly lost graveyard. I have to admit, it does gall me somewhat that the bishops of Winchester were so happy to profit from these women and do nothing for them in life and, again, nothing for them in death. By allowing them to be buried in unconsecrated ground, they were jeopardising their immortal souls. Depending on what you believe, but certainly for the Catholic faith, of which the Bishop of Winchester subscribed for many centuries, burial in unconsecrated ground meant very, very bad things for your immortal soul. The Bishops of Winchester allowed these women to be decried and derided during their lifetime and then forgotten in death. And that just mounts hypocrisy on hypocrisy, as far as I'm concerned. If this video has whetted your appetite and you're interested to learn more about the Crossbones Cemetery Project and the work of the community there, I will be leaving a link to their website. And if you're in the UK or you're coming to the UK, I believe they do have tours of Crossbones that you can book through that website. So do check that out. I'd also love to know what you think of this story, of the tale of the Winchester geese. So let me know in the comment section down below or come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave the links in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue the conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by clicking the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.